Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Laura Coupe, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Diversity National Security Network. And just to tell you a little bit about the Diversity National Security Network, we exist because we want to amplify the contributions of diverse foreign policy and national security experts and also to help them create opportunities in this space. So far, we've profiled and highlighted about 160 national security experts from the Black, Latinx, and Asian American Pacific Islander community. And just also be on a lookout for, for a couple lists coming out this next month. Again, we are really grateful for New America and having been such a great, uh, such a great partner in highlighting our hashtag NextGenNatSec honorees. And I wanna get to why we're here today. So three months to date, George Floyd was unfortunately murdered by police officers in Minneapolis. And many, many have highlighted this moment as leading to a national reckoning on systemic racism in our society and the many injustices that Black Americans in the United States face. And we've also been reminded that just a couple of days ago, another unarmed Black man, Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, was shot by police highlighting again that racial justice issues are not going anywhere and that we'll need dedicated efforts and discussions around how to confront it. But like the title suggests, we wanted to highlight that George Floyd changed the world. Not only did we see protests here in the United States, but we saw them globally. And it highlighted again that the United States really has the opportunity to have very difficult discussions, including racism, not only here in the United States, but also broadly and also credit this moment for highlighting the misalignment of the American ideals that we preach overseas and what the realities are here domestically, particularly for Black Americans. And it will not be possible for the US to build a coherent values-based foreign policy if we don't have honest discussions about race in our domestic and foreign policy. And that is why we wanted this community to identify ways in which we could talk about the impact of racism in our domestic and foreign policy in more sustainable ways so that we hopefully have change not only for immediate, for the immediate, but also for the long term. And that's why we're so grateful to, for New America to have partnered with us to have this dialogue on a main stage. And today's panel that we'll, I'll introduce just in a, in a couple of minutes, we'll discuss the progress that we've made since May, but hopefully also help us identify ways in which we can progress and, and move towards collective change. And then we are also very eager to, have, to hear your thoughts and reflections during our town hall portion, which will be led by another fellow co-founder of the Diverse National School Network, Asha Castleberry, and then we'll close with comments from Dr. Millette Mesfin, who's also a board member of our organization. And just to give the floor to someone who's already led or has already been leading in creating this lasting change that I just talked about, I'm going to quickly give Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins the floor, who she's the leader of uh, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. And they just started a pledge called Standing Up to Racism and Discrimination, which I want her to talk about because it's basically a call out to the foreign policy national security establishment to talk about racism and discrimination in more sustainable ways. Ambassador Jenkins. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to everyone who invited me here today to chat uh, about this very, very important issue and on this uh, momentous occasion today. Um, as Laura said, uh, I established uh, Women of Color Advance in Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation in 2017 with the need and the uh, importance for increasing the voice, voices of women of color in peace and security issues, foreign policy and national security. And what we recognize very soon is really just how important this is. And nothing came more uh, a slap in the face than what happened uh, in Minneapolis with George Floyd. Um, we recognize that this is really a moment that we need to seek real change not just conversation, but movement, action. As a result, Women of Color Advance in Peace and Security released a statement on June 9th that has over currently over 220 signatures. And we also released a similar statement with our chapter in the United Kingdom, which also has now about 80 signatures, signatures that represent both organizations and individuals who commit to make change. Currently, the solidarity statement has 13, has 12 commitments, 
These commitments range from everything to ensuring that organizations have a body, have a staff, have a board, have an advisory committee, whatever they have that looks like America, that it actually has steps to deal with issues like microaggressions, to deal with issues that people of color have to deal with in a workspace, to recognize that there are differences and to recognize that until we deal with racism and discrimination in our organizations, until we increase the voices of diverse people and our policies and all the institutions that lead to foreign policy in America, that we will not make change, we will never make change. And we recognize that culture is a very difficult thing to make different, it's a very difficult thing to change, and it's a part of who, what we, who we are. And so we have this uh, entity now with many organizations that represent think tanks, NGOs, philanthropy, uh, and also such areas as peace and security, of course, national security. We even have media, we have art, we have human rights organizations, humanitarian organizations. All of these entities have signed a statement and are now working together. We've established working groups that represent the 12, organi the 12 commitments, and they are working together now to establish goals, commitments, strategies, metrics, and a time frame in which to achieve each one of these commitments. We've also established a separate, commitment, a separate committee and working group just to focus on our new and next generation to ensure that what we're doing now is going to be incorporated into our future leadership in America and abroad. We've also done a survey, which we're going to be releasing the results in the next three weeks, which is going to let us see where organizations are now and where we will be in six months and where we will be a year from now. And we will continue these surveys to, as a way to check and see if we're making progress. The organization and what we're doing is, is being uh, uh, recognized. We're putting together our website, which we're going to launch very soon. It'll list all of this work that we're doing, all the commitments, all the organizations and individuals who are working with us. And we also, of course, recognize that we would like to welcome others who have not yet signed the commitment. If you're interested in reading about it, reading it, learning more about it, signing it, and even more importantly, you can go to our website, of course, at wcaps.org, or just send us an email at wcaps at wcaps.org. With that, I want to turn it back over to Laura. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to a really productive conversation. Thanks so much, Bonnie. So now I'm going to go quickly and introduce our panelists and moderators, because I know that's who you all really want to hear from. So in terms of our panel, so first we'll introduce Michelle Flournoy, who is the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. And she's the former co-founder and CEO of the Center for New American Security. And currently she serves on their board. And in her most recent role in government, Michelle served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 2012. Next is Alonzo Fulham. Alonzo Fulgham is Executive Vice President for Defense and Homeland for Viatech Corporation. Alonzo was the first African American to lead the largest bilateral aid program in the world in Afghanistan, the first African, African American COO of USAID, and was the first African American to serve as Acting Administrator for USAID when he was appointed by President Barack Obama in 2009. We've already heard from Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who's the founder and executive director of WCAPS. In her most recent role in government, Ambassador Jenkins served as special envoy and coordinator for threat, coordination, threat reduction programs in the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation at the Department of State in the Obama administration. And then our final panelist is Camille Stewart, who is an attorney and executive whose tech, cyber, and national security experience has landed her in roles at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, Deloitte, and Google. Camille is a New America political reform and a political reform program fellow and a co-founder of the Diversity National Security Network. And finally, the panel will be moderated by Anne-Marie Slaughter, the current CEO of New America. And from 2009 to 2011, she served as the Director of Policy Planning at the State Department, the first woman to hold that position. Anne-Marie, I'm turning it over to you. Laura, thanks. And I, I, it's an honor for me to be able to do this. Uh, but I really want to say that this event is very important to the work that New America uh, is doing and will continue to do. Our mission is 
uh, renewing the promise of America uh, by continuing the quest to live up to our highest ideals. And that in many ways is what this moment is about. Uh, the, the complete exposure of the gap between who we are and who we say we are and who we want to be. I, I genuinely believe that the vast majority of Americans uh, want to be a place where all people are created equal, but we are manifestly not. So the work uh, that the Diversity and National Security Network is doing, that uh, the women of color advancing peace and security uh, are doing, that is essential uh, to closing this gap between who we, we say we are uh, and, and who we actually are. So we're, we're really honored to be able to host this uh, and particularly with this great panel. I, I'm going to, with, with, uh, I hope Ambassador Jenkins, you will allow me to call you Bonnie because I know everybody else well and I, I don't want to single you out as Ambassador uh, Jenkins. It's really a pleasure uh, to, to have my, these fellow panelists. Alonzo and I were, I, when I was new Director of Policy Planning, he was the Acting Director of USAID and we sat in many meetings together and it's wonderful to see him uh, here and Michelle and I have been around the same table for longer than either of us probably want to admit. Uh, and Camille, I know less well, uh, but have been really uh, impressed both following uh, your writings, but also what, what this, this network uh, of others are doing and we're fellow lawyers. So you know, we're always happy to have a lawyer. So I want to, to start by saying that two yesterday, uh, I was doing an, a, a podcast with Steve Waltz, uh, who is at the Kennedy School, and he's been surveying lots and lots of people about what would you tell a new president, assuming there's President Biden in November, what needs to change? What's your top priority? And he said to me that a very large number of the foreign policy people he has been interviewing say, we have to fix ourselves at home first. So this is striking. These are foreign policy people and he's asking them what you would advise a new president about foreign policy. And they're saying, we have to start at home. Uh, that, that really this is the core uh, of, of how we engage the world is addressing both COVID, I think many of the people he was interviewing are talking about the pandemic, but also systemic racism, the, the George Floyd moment, which itself is powered by the evident disparity in infections and deaths among black and brown communities in this country. It's not, you know, COVID's here and, and the, the uh, moment of awakening after George Floyd's murder is here. They are, they are deeply uh, connected. So I guess the, the place I would want to start, uh, and Alonzo, I'll, I'll start with you and we'll, we'll sort of move around, although not everybody has to answer every question because we also want to get to the uh, audience's questions. Um, how, do you, how do you think about that question? Uh, th that you know, you're, you've, you've been in international development all your life. <laughs> you've uh, been outward looking but right now that outward looking and inward problems are interrelated in such a deep way. How do we address that as a national security community? And you're on mute. You have to unmute. Yep, there you go. <laughs> I'm unmuted. There you go, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, I think uh, when you look at this question, um, you have to really think about the people um, that we have seen before us. You know, the Ed Perkins who went out to South Africa uh, during apartheid uh, to be the first African-American ambassador. Uh, you have to look at Terrence Todman, what he went through uh, and the State Department. Uh, this is a, a, a different time for us um, and it's, it's a special time. Uh, when you look at the movement that's currently going on in the country, it's with our young people. Uh, they are probably the most educated, they're young, they're informed, and one of the smartest populations in the world. And that's important uh, because I think they're media savvy 
and capable of real disruption to the business community, to the NGOs, uh, and to the foreign policy community. I think what we're trying to figure out now is what are the things that we need to do going forward? Uh, how do we really start to rebuild our institutions that allow for us to represent the best of what America had to offer? You think about it before this administration, one of the things that we went out and propagated throughout the world was that the rule of law in our country stood for something. Our foreign policy stood for something. We were respected. And even as an African-American going out, knowing that we had problems at home, we knew we could depend on our institutions. So I think that's one of the things when they talk about we've got to repair our homes before we can go out and talk to people again. Those are some of the things that we have to do. And I think at the State Department, at DOD, uh, at USAID, and the CIA, and all of our agencies, that's one of the things that we've got to reconstitute and create an environment that really is the environment that we think we want going forth. And I think that's gonna come from great appointments uh, by, this new, by this new president. And hopefully some of the people on this line will be a part of that because I think they can be integral in trying to rebuild and constitute the kinds of institutions that represent the best of what America has to offer. Thank you. So, so Michelle, let me ask you to first unmute and then to uh, <laughs> uh, to comment on that. I mean, you you were you know number three at DoD, uh, and DoD is an interesting place. Obviously, we have you know, large numbers of of service people of color. Uh, that gets much smaller as you get up to the, toward the top of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or DoD. But more broadly, the Alonzo's point that we have to reflect who we are in the people we present to the world. Right. So I, I would add to Alonzo's very good points. Um, first of all, um, one of my favorite phrases from uh, Joe Biden when he was vice president was this notion of when people look to the U.S. for leadership and credibility, it's not as much the example of our power as the power of our example. So if we are not living up to our values, if we are um, not being true you know, as a democracy, if we're you know, not dealing effectively with systemic racism and inequality and injustice, we're not dealing effectively with the pandemic, it's very hard for us to be the leader that other countries want to follow when we try to build coalitions for things like combating climate change or, or whatever the, the transnational or global threat may be. So it's really, really important for us to have our house in order at home in order to be effective abroad uh, uh, in, in protecting our interests. But in addition, I think there's another issue and that we are, when we have a national security cadre that does not look like America, we are leaving a huge amount of talent on the table. Um, and all of the business literature says that if the boards, if the executive leadership teams of organizations are more diverse, they make better decisions and they actually perform better. They outperform their competitors in measurable ways consistently. Um, and just to give you a snapshot of how far we are from that goal of diversity, inclusion, and national security, if you take a look at 2018, 93 people running the federal government were white and 80% were men. In the State Department, Black Americans represent about 15% of the total workforce, but only 6% of the Foreign Service. In the intelligence community, minority groups represent 25% of employees, only 13% of senior positions. Um, when you look at the military, 41 of the most senior commanders in the US military, only two today are black. And my favorite and shocking example is between the appointment of Colin Powell, Colin Powell as the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the recent appointment of CQ Brown as the first Black service chief with 31 years. Wow. You got that. I didn't realize it's been that long. <laughs> 31 wow. years. So wow. we have a problem. You yeah. know, and I think the one, one of the most important things we need to do in this moment is like hold up a mirror to ourselves as a community and say, we are not where we need to be. So Camille, let me turn to you. And and uh, you you and Bonnie have both you know, taken action to address this problem by creating organizations and and by 
for one thing, just putting a whole group of people together. When I look at a, a meeting, even on Twitter, or I look at a, a WCAPS uh, a group, and we've had other events at New America, and you look around the audience and you say, hey, this does not look like a national security meeting in Washington, but every single person in, the, in this meeting is not everyone, but most are of color, and they're all highly talented, to Michelle's point that we're just leaving talent on the table. But when you look at it, and you're also of a different generation, do, how do you see us fixing this problem? I mean, you, you, you want to make clear who the people are, but you know, often just identifying them is, isn't enough. How do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, we really need to reimagine the systems and, and, and institutions that uphold our government, right? Many of them, frankly, all of them were not created with people of color in mind. And so even some of the logistics about how we get folks into government organizations are broken. Our security clearance process doesn't allow for people of immigrant backgrounds to easily flow through that process. We need to <laughs> reevaluate how we're engaging diaspora communities um, and think about how we build systems and institutions that achieve the goals that we, are, we set out to, to achieve, the ideals we set out for this nation, um, but think about ways that we engage different communities and open up the breadth of talent. And so some of that is creating platforms to demonstrate and display the talent, which is a lot of the work that Diversity and National Security Network has done. Some of that is uh, grooming new talent, which is a lot of the work that WCAPS is doing. But we cannot ignore the fact that the system is not built for, for everyone and should be. And we cannot ignore the fact that to Alonzo and Michelle's point, we are not as effective. We do not show up on the world stage effectively or as our best selves. We are not as innovative. We are not as um, representative of what we hope to be if we are not harnessing the lived experiences of the American people, if we are not bringing our best, our most diverse workforce to bear on these really challenging and complex problems that are ever evolving. Uh, so that's a very important point about the clearances and the ways you get into government. I mean, all of us have had uh, <laughs> with the clearance process, which I do think is very broken, but your point, yeah. you know, as a nation that reflects the world, we can't get the people who don't, you know, who are more newly American uh, in, that won't work. So Bonnie, I mean, you, you, you saw this when you were in the State Department, you now run CAPS, you were before that at the Ford Foundation, right? You pushed at this from, from you sort of seen what a philanthropist can do. How do, so we, same question, but we've got the list, we got the talent, we changed some of the systems. How do we push to actually make this change. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, binders of women. <laughs> well, I mean, there has to be a real commitment. I mean, it's one thing to say we want change, and it's another thing to actually make change. Um, I think it's, it's too easy to go back to the status quo. It's too easy to be in a moment and say, we need to do this, we need to do this. And then after time goes by, things go back to the way they are. One, because as I said, culture is hard to change. And it's hard to change behavior and it's hard to change what people do. And unless there's a continuous push to make it happen, it won't happen. Um, it's also related to the fact that the, the, the decision makers are not the people who, who are the ones who are often demanding most of the change. Because of the decision makers, the, one that, the ones who are what we call the gatekeepers are often not the, the people of color. Um, they're often not the women. And so it's easier for them to go back to the status quo because it's comfortable for them. Um, it's a privileged situation for them. And so unless you make them either one, extremely uncomfortable in a way that's public or really help them understand why it's in everyone's benefit, not just the people who are saying change, but for everyone that change needs to happen, it won't happen. So it has to be consistent. It cannot stop. You know, you have to, keep making the case, keep making the point. This time we're in right now, everyone's talking about it. It's the point that everyone's trying to make, but where will we be a year from now? Where will yep. we be six months? And that's what we have to think about in order to make that change and all this that we're trying to do, you have to be sustained and you have to have people who are saying, this is what I'm trying to do. 
Anne Marie, can I add one more point to that? I, I think I agree with everything that's being said, but I also think that if we roll the tape back 20 years, we were probably having the same conversations. I think what we have to think about as we go forward, we've got to be much more judicious and systematic about the change that we want to bring about. In the 90s, Larry Eagleburger, who's a beloved former Secretary of State of the State Department, um, was being beat up in the press about the fact of lack of women and people of color um, in, in, in foreign policy. He turned around and made an edict that said everybody, every office in the State Department had to have a woman and a person of color in their front office. That began to send the message through the whole building. We didn't need legislation. We didn't need a bunch of people trying to figure out how they're going to rewrite the rules to support what he wanted. He said, do it. Okay, the only problem with that was once Larry Eagleburger left, then all the minions or the carriers of racism went back to the system as it was. So we have to figure out a way to lay out a process that says that it becomes institutionalized. Uh, how do we get processes in place in all of these panels and all these the processes that promote and move people through the system that actually stand the test of time once those individuals go away? And until we start addressing those issues, because we can always beat up on the politicals, but it's the people within the system, the, 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 the director general of the Foreign Service, your head of HR, your chief diversity officer, which some things that people are pushing for. You got to start attacking the problem, which is rewarding bad behavior for people who are not doing the things that need to be done to move the system forward. And until you address that, we're going to be back in this conversation 10 years from now. So I'm hoping that the new administration, once they get in, that there's some real systemic things that are put in place to stop this bad behavior and stop encouraging it. And there's some other things we could talk about, but I don't want to hog the mic, but go ahead. No, so I, I think this, I think that's very important. Uh, I mean, Michelle said it, 31 years. I mean, many of us are old enough, we've been in these conversations for too long. Mm -hmm. And frankly, this is also why, the, I hope deeply that the this moment after George Floyd and obviously the violence, police brutality against black men, against people of color continues. We've just seen this, but, but, but it's gotten more sustained attention than ever before in my lifetime. And our job is to capture the energy of this moment and the generational and demographic change in the United States and make it real. Two things, though, uh, Bonnie said something that I want to highlight because it's so important. You talked about the gatekeepers. So when I got to Washington, uh, first time ever in, in 2009, I'm about 50, and I realized pretty quickly that the place is run by 32-year-olds, right? They're the special assistants there. That, I mean, obviously, there's lots of power, but the, the folks who are, you know, in there deciding who's in the meeting, who, who's, it's not exactly who gets hired, but who gets suggested. There's a whole lot of, of, of folks at, in key places that you might not necessarily recognize are key places, particularly people coming in who are very important on the outside. And we've got to make sure they have the right commitment. And the example I would give is Cheryl Mills was Secretary Clinton's chief of staff, and she was fierce about hiring. And over and over again, you know, assistant secretary would come to her and say, I've got this perfect person. I want to hire them as a DAS. And she'd say, you know, let me see your slate. If there weren't people of color on it, you know, she would say no. And she really pushed through a bunch of appointments. And those folks are now poised to be assistant secretaries themselves this time around. So that that piece of it, I do think is 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 critical as well as as you know, adopting those kinds of, of policies. Michelle, I want to shift ground a little bit because, again, we've got this um, double-sided issue of people and policies, right? Who's around the table makes a really big difference in what is decided. And that's what we're all saying, right? That until we diversify the who, we're not going to get a lot of change on the what. But at the same time, if you're thinking about, and I know you are thinking about, what is U.S. policy uh, what is our defense policy? What is our grand strategy? How do we articulate our priorities in the world our, as a, you know, a values-based foreign policy, great power competition, even things, I know you've written a lot about deterrence. 
how do we weave the diversity of who we are and the goals we seek into the policy? No, it's a great question. But again, I think it starts with having a diverse team around the table because not only gender diversity, but diversity of uh, ethnic background, but also I love Camille's phrase, diversity of lived experience, right? I mean, and because what happens is that brings all of that experience to the table with them. And, you know, we watched this in President Obama's Situation Room, where you certainly had a more diverse group, it wasn't perfect, but it's more diverse than had probably been any previous set of people that sat around that table in the past. And what I saw time and time again when we were wrestling with a hard problem is that diversity work to help the president. So someone comes in with a dissenting view, someone questions this, the assumption that, you know, groupthink is start, just starting to form around. Someone else says, have, we, well, have you thought about this or what about that? Just that diversity of perspective that consistently, I think, helped the president better understand the risks, the pros, the cons, make better decisions. Um, so I think it starts there, but that same diversity also brings diversity of expertise. So for example, you know, if we're talking about how to make peace negotiations in Afghanistan successful, well, there happens to be a body of literature that says if you include women in the peace negotiation teams in a serious way, all of the studies show that those, the settlements that come out of those negotiations will be more sustainable and be implemented over time. Right. You know, if in Alonzo's world, there's now all kinds of studies that show if you empower women and girls in the pr approach you take to development, you're gonna have much more success in lifting whole communities out of poverty. So. My point is, it's the diversity of people around the table that are gonna bring you that diversity of expertise and experience that's gonna make your policy more effective because you're attending to a much you know, broader range of what works, you yep. know, yeah. experience and what actually works. Yeah. So Camille, if you, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I was going to say we're all we're all we're back to the square one again, though, to be able to do those kind of things, you have to be in the room and you've got to have policymakers who are who are convinced that they want to make sure that that room that they're representing looks like America. I look at my uh, experience in Afghanistan, although I was the aid mission director there. Uh, Ron Newman was one of our finest ambassadors that we've ever had in the United States made sure as the aid director that I was a part of the national security conversation. And there were things that I brought to that conversation that people were shocked and amazed. Oh my God, how's an aid guy know that? It's not an aid guy, it's that we are all a part of the national security of this country. So we have to have the commitment of the principles to look around that room and say, hey, we don't have people that really represent the best of what America has to offer. I want all uh, voices in the room so that I can make a good decision. They always say there's no bad policy, it's bad input. And the input comes from the people around that table. Yeah. Well, so let me, I, I was going to ask Camille, if you think about a meeting of the Diversity and National Security Network, and you think about talking about any particular issue on the table, whether you're talking about climate change, or you're talking about US-China relations, but whatever, do you have a sense, and this may be generational again, as much as, as, as gender uh, and, and ethnic and racial diversity, uh, but do you have a sense that you get different answers, or that, that there's a, there's a, mo a, a a divergence, I'm not talking about completely different, between what you all are talking about and what's coming out even of a, a Democratic White House or a White House that would be much more closely politically aligned. Definitely. Didn't take long for that. <laughs> yeah, between the diaspora backgrounds, generational differences, I think, you know, folks tend to be a bit more critical um, and have a lot more uh, interwoven experiences. A lot of the mid-career, the early senior career folks who are engaged in diversity and national security network have had experiences in industry, have had experiences in government, have had experiences in research, 
and they bring those things together in a way that is a little bit different from the traditional, I've spent my entire life in government or I've spent my entire life in industry. Not to mention, you know, integrating technology and how that has expanded and changed our lives. Folks with um, you know, immigrant backgrounds and things like that, the discussion is enriched in a way that um, often amazes me much more if that was brought to the rooms and to the situation room and into the White House, right? We, we are seeing that the nuanced discussions, the ability to talk firsthand about how the communities in the places that we are going and engaging will respond to that outcome, how we even just word that to uh, promote better efficacy or reception of a, a policy or proposal um, comes out not only because we've got these folks in the room, but because they feel included. They feel empowered to actually engage in the discussion. And so part of what we need to talk about in these diversity discussions, the inclusion piece, right? Let's not just have people on the slate. Let's make sure that they feel included enough, empowered enough to actually lend their experiences to the dialogue. That might not change the outcome every time, but to the extent that they feel like it is a consideration as we, you know, figure out the plans, as we execute, that will enrich the discussion, not just having folks in the room, but making sure they're empowered enough to speak. So that's such an important point. And it goes back, Perfect. it also goes back to numbers though, because certainly as a woman, I know, and there's a lot of research on this, you need three women in the room before we'll start saying what we think. And even <laughs> then, we're not really gonna say everything that we think, but we're, we're gonna be a lot closer. If you're the only woman in the room, and you all know this also as a person of color, you, you know, you often outman the man, outman the men in the sense that you, 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 you're not included. There's not, a, there's not enough uh, real space for you to be who you are. And all of us, you know, have a gap between our personal and our professional selves, but inclusion is very different than, than diversity in that, in that sense. So Bonnie, I'm gonna ask you that same question about um, uh, WCAPS, but, but I'm gonna put it a little even more pointedly because you and I were at the State Department at the same time. And again, you, you've had a lot of experience do you th so we were in the state department when secretary clinton was really pushing the elevation of development right she went in saying three d's defense diplomacy and development and it was my experience in the state department that many of the senior women she appointed and many of the women period were much more on board with that vision than many of the men that's a stereotype and alonzo here has been a development professional all his life but I just, I wonder, you know, do you think if we had a far more diverse group of people in the State Department, 50-50 men and women, and look like America, would we, would we privilege development more? Um, I, you know, I think that's a great question. And I think it's totally fair to answer, ask it. And I think it's totally fair for you to have your perception that it would be a little bit more balanced. Um, I would say yes. And, you know, I think there are different ways in which um, we look at things and look at um, issues. Um, I know in my conversation with many of the women in, in my organization, um, and there's always a balance of, um, there's much more of a desire for a balance between the three Ds. You know, and we have a significant number of women and young, and young women uh, in season who are very, understand the importance of the three um, and understand why you need to have the balance of the three and having only one, which I think we, many people believe we have much more of the defense than the other two right now. Um, the importance of that and having a balanced foreign policy overall. Um, and so, yes, I think that is a valid perception based on what I hear, based on the conversations that we have, based on the understanding of um, what each one of those Ds bring to the table. Um, I would say, I mean, I would even venture, and it, here I am going into on territory I may not be, should be going into, but I would venture to say that um, you see a lot fewer people of color, a lot fewer women, for example, at State Department. Yep. You see, and you see that I think in other places, um, and, I all, and I don't wanna say it's a cause and effect, but there certainly is a lot more of a focus now 
on the military side and the defense side and the role that it plays. And defense is important, but the other two are important as well. So I would say I certainly hear that conversation and that balance a lot more in my conversations that I have. Thanks. Uh, I mean, it is, I often used to laugh that if you called a national security meeting in Washington, it would be 80, 90% men and there are men, men or women. If you called a development meeting, it would flip. That's again, not entirely true. And Alonzo, I wanna push on this because even when I say that, I'm very aware that I'm uh, that I'm perilously close to essentialism, right? I'm women like soft stuff like development, no. men like no. hard stuff like guns. People of color are interested in Africa. People, white people are interested in Europe. We, so we don't want to go there either. So you no, no, it. I, I I think your arguments are, are good. I think the the bigger issue is that I think this conversation had been coming. Um, uh, former. Um, uh, General Zinni uh, had the first op-ed uh, back in the 90s and in, in the early 2000s about the fact that we need to bring soft power into play. And I think it was the first time in our government after that that we started thinking about a coherent policy to address our national interest. And when you saw the way we were organizing, if you ask General Petraeus what his thoughts are and the other generals who've been in the, in the theater where we were really fighting the war, it was bringing our national interest into play and using all of our assets equally to ensure that we were able to implement policy in an effective way. The problem began when, when the administrations change, everyone decides that let's go back to the game as it was played before. And I think that's lack of vision. And I think that's one of the things that we have to look at. I was hoping that Tony was gonna be on the line today because I think we also have to take a look at the 1947 National Security Act. We have to turn it on its head. This is not your father's Oldsmobile anymore. Uh, <laughs> we've got a typical, a new generation of, of, of foreign service officers that are gonna have to address problems that are so much different than we addressed 30 or 40 years ago. And then the Security Council is gonna have to be reorganized. You need to have somebody from public diplomacy on the Security Council. Why? Communication is everything. And when we lost USIS, that was one of the biggest losses that we had in our national security apparatus. The Chinese are spending four or five billion dollars on public diplomacy, on, 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 on blogging, uh, all of the, uh, the assets that we use to communicate today, they're invested heavily in it. And they have people that are doing it effectively. And we have a department within the State Department that's addressing it. So those kind of things in economic and trade, all of those things are going to be coming to full play in the future and having somebody deliver the message to the Economic Bureau about what's happening in those particular areas or in public diplomacy, I think is a failure of our policy. And it's something we're gonna have to take a look at. So Michelle, I'll ask you, that Michelle at least was Tony's uh, co-founder of West Exec. <laughs> yeah, and Tony's a good friend. That's not a criticism, but I think no, it's something no. that we have to have a conversation about that uh, the traditionalists don't wanna change things. And the world has changed. And, and I think with leadership like, uh, Michelle and others, I think we can have that conversation and really think about making that change because in the, in the previous administration um, with, uh, uh, with Secretary, she did think about, uh, Secretary Clinton thought about the fact that we needed to address this issue, but we weren't able to do it. Absolutely. But I, so I was gonna ask Michelle just to, to address the, the response and particularly the idea that we, we might need to revise the National Security Act, that we really might need to think about our security much more broadly, too broadly, and it's nothing, right? Then it, it's everything and then it's nothing. But you're at the core of this because you are a DOD person who sees much more broadly. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I don't know if we need to revise the 47 Act, but we do need to revise how we are um, using and resourcing the tools in the toolbox because there is an imbalance. And I think, frankly, many, you know, the, the people you mentioned, the General Zinnis, the Dave Petraeuses, the General McChrystals and others, they're the first ones who would say, I needed more diplomats, I needed mm -hmm. more AID, I needed more yeah. informational instruments. The military cannot do these things by itself. We, Diplomacy should be first and foremost preventing the conflict in the first place. If you do find yourself in a conflict, the last 20 yards on the field is always the political settlement and the diplomatic piece. Um, you know, you can go, the, the, the times we've been most effective is when we 
have marry our diplomacy with some coercive pressure behind it to, to force people to come to the negotiating table seriously. So there are so many examples of this, and yet we do not, as Bonnie said, we don't resource things in a balanced way. Um, now, you're never going to need as much money at the State Department as you do for defense because you're not buying aircraft carriers and tanks and airplanes, but you certainly need a much more robust and expeditionary and full, fulsome diplomatic instrument, including the Foreign Service. And same goes for AID. And I, too, would love to see a 21st century digital version of what USIA used to be. Um, <laughs> so we do need to invest in those non-military instruments and in the end of the day it will result in fewer americans being sent into harm's way and it will result when we do have to send people in harm's way we'll get better outcomes because there are robust diplomatic and other instruments to to use alongside them so i think that's really really it's an important point and i actually think it's maybe less controversial than people think i think a lot of experienced people in uniform would love to see a stronger, you know, and more sizable foreign service, for example, and diplomatic court. But Michelle, if we don't ask the question because the, the, the actual structure is what's causing us not to be able to move forward. So we tried the QDDR, right? Mm -hmm. And we were using that as a way to better um, provide funding for the civilian side of the equation so we wouldn't have to go to the military. And then as soon as the administration ended, we went back to, you know, to the things, the way things were. Yeah. And, I, and then so then we were back again to, yeah, we don't want to tamper with it. But I think the world has changed so much that they got to have a conversation. I think I, we have to. Yeah, no, I think we should look at it. And the I'm just always loath to um, go for painful legislation and organizational changes when other things could fix it. So I got you. I, got you know, you. I, I think I would love to see, I mean, I actually think the bigger problem is the politics of the color of money. You know, voting for a defense dollar is a patriotic act on the Hill. Yeah. Voting for AID is, oh, we're giving money away. And voting for State Department is, why am I building bureaucracy? I mean, it's terrible and that's unfair, but the, the, the politics of it have to be addressed. Um, but I think the biggest thing is leadership. It is, you know, uh, stating that we're going to do some things differently, whether it's, you know, Cheryl's, I'm not going to look at a slate unless there are diverse qualified candidates on the slate, whether it's promoting, you know, I'm going to start evaluating supervisors based on their support for diversity and inclusion and the kind of environment they create, whether it's, I mean, you could go through all kinds of things, but leadership, incentives, measuring what you care about, and then actually holding people accountable. I mean, yep. you know, it's going to take someone not getting promoted because they didn't do the right thing. More. That we that we more. Thanks. <laughs> so we are just about to turn it over uh, to your questions, everyone who is, is participating here. Uh, but I'm going to give Camille and, and Bonnie the last word and ask about uh, a new generation of foreign policy intellectuals and international relations scholars uh, who've been publishing a lot, particularly in foreign policy, and writing about post-colonialism and racism. And, and the, you know, w w when I grew up, it was like Europe, yep, they were the imperialists. We were anti-imperialists. I knew the critiques that we'd had a, so a soft imperialism, economic imperialism. But fundamentally, post-colonialism was some, somebody else's problem. It would, didn't apply to the United States. That is not the vision. And again, if you may put more people around the table who've had the experience, I think Barack Obama had, had, had grown up partly in Indonesia uh, and his father was Kenyan. <laughs> it certainly seen British imperialism. So he had a different take on that. I'd love for both of you just to reflect on what what may happen in terms of how we think of ourselves uh, in a, a post-imperial, post-colonial era, but where an awful lot of the legacies of colonialism are, are very, very evident. If we did have a far more diverse group of people around the table, how would we, how would we talk about it? How would we think about it? So Camille and then Bonnie, you get to bring us home. Yeah, I, 
the discussion would evolve drastically. Um, the perspectives of particularly diaspora and immigrant communities, to your point, um, reflect living through colonialism in a, in a very real way. And the understanding of that how race underpins many of our uh, development and aid decisions and how those things then impact these communities and how those things then tie into our defense and our security and, um, and, and the full circle of issues. And so there would be a strong interjection of dissent and differing opinions on how a strategic move in a development area or um, a defense action or any other action for that matter will impact the communities, impact the legacy of the US in those spaces, impact how we are then able to circle back. Um, you know, Chinese investment in infrastructure in the Caribbean and in Africa is, is looked at very different by people of those communities or diaspora of those communities than it is by folks of the majority and folks that are traditionally from the European continent. So there will be a vast difference in how that dialogue happens because to some, some small nations in the Caribbean and Africa may not be major world stage players, but how they move through Europe and the US in particular, but the world in general matters and matters to what they bring as new US citizens, as new European citizens. So the dialogue will evolve drastically and will call for a more holistic discussion about how we engage with um, and view other nations that are not traditionally part of some of these broader discussions. Thank you. I, I, I love that the, I love the visibility of the change that would come. So Bonnie, what would you say? Yeah, you I can think navigate this more. <laughs> you have been able to yeah, say I, what Camille just said 20 years ago. <laughs> right. Um, I think, you know, by look, I think the whole question for me calls into question, calls also calls into question how we see ourselves as Americans. How, how do we see ourselves? How do we view ourselves? Asking ourselves questions that we have not been, that we've been afraid to ask ourselves that we've been taught not to ask ourselves, um, a perception of who is America in the world without presupposing who we are um, and not presupposing that this is what we've learned and that is the way it is. I think a lot for me of this moment and a lot of what's happening now is we are questioning, are we the greatest power? Do we really know it all. Are we the best people to go around the world and dictate how things should be when we have so many questions at home? Um, I think that's a scary question for us as a country because we pride so much ourselves on who we have always perceived ourselves to be as the leader. And not that we should assume that we're not who we who we can be or who we have been, but we should be willing to question ourselves more than we have and be willing to come up with the answer, which may be, we do have a lot of problems. We see them, but we try to cover them or ignore them or point our fingers at others and say, you have this problem with voting. You have this problem with elections. We have so many of them here. We're watching everyone else's elections and we can't even do our own. So I think this whole post-colonialism, this whole post is, to me, who are we really? Who do we want to be? Let's be honest about it. Let's be honest about how we have been in other countries, how we have treated other countries, how we treat them, and how we treat ourselves. And look at that as a package. And do we have the courage to ask that question and get the answers that we'll get? That was a fabulous answer. And I think it's time to turn uh, to questions. I'll just say uh, Heather Herbert, who we'll he hear from, um, tweeted yesterday, Arturo Sarakan, Sarakan who was the uh, Mexican ambassador to the United States, again, uh, Alonzo Michelle Noem, uh, wrote yesterday on Twitter something about essentially the United States has been pointing to election irregularities in Latin America forever. You know, oh my God, those terrible electoral systems, they don't work. And he basically said, 
gee, you know, amazing when it happens to you. And, uh, <laughs> but but uh, I really do think this question of, if we were who we really are, if represented in the tables of power, if, if the tables of power looked like America, we would ask, who are we? I, for one, would take great pride in our diversity, but I would have to accept that the, you know, narrative of World War II, America the good, would definitely have to change, but I think we'd be better for it. Not that we're all bad, but we're certainly not all good. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Asha Castleberry, who is I have written an article with, but had never met uh, visually or personally. Nobody meets personally anymore until yesterday. So, <laughs> Asha. Thank you, Anne Marie. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for having this uh, wonderful panel, especially between Diversity National Security Network and New America. Um, this is like our second event. And this has been a op wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas and talk about a way forward. Um, as the visionary leader, as well as the primary co-founder of, of Diversity National Security Network, I'm just so excited to be here and now open up to Q&A. So our first question we have is, what's the best way for allies from the majority to leverage our power without tripping all over ourselves with awkwardly phrased questions. From Lynn Well, a longtime Hill staffer and a State Department uh, person, and this is to Alonzo and Orbani. Bonnie, go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> Uh, so the question is to be exact. Um, how do we how do we be good allies? Is that basically how do we be good allies and not trip over ourselves? I mean, is that is that the okay? Um, uh, there's so many ways to define allies, and I've I've actually tried to write on this, and I've never actually been able to uh, to write anything. I don't think the question is um, tripping over yourselves or worrying about that. I think for me, it's um, being uh, not just a support for what we're trying to achieve or ways in which we're trying to achieve change. Um, it's also understanding how to be a partner in that and how to champion that on your own. Um, there are things that are done to be in the front, to be a partner, and there are things that are done when there's no camera, when there are th not things going on that you really believe and you really support. And to me, a, a way to promote are these goals of diversity, these goals of anti-racism, these goals of anti-discrimination, these goals of change in foreign policy, is to not only understand it and believe it and to ask questions that may seem stupid, but to ask questions and be willing to understand that you may not know the answer and that's okay because you've grown up in a culture that tells you that you're supposed to believe a certain thing. It's really to, to understand it inside and understand it in a way that you can go out and champion it yourself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and we, it, it's interesting because a good ally is sometimes hard to define, but you know a good ally is when you see it and people can know when they're a good ally because of what they believe in and their actions follow their belief. Yeah. But there is always action. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add one small piece. I think one of the things that you have to, you'll learn as you spend time overseas, it's about relationships. And there are two conversations. There's the official conversation and there's the unofficial conversation. Um, and in the official conversation, you're representing the best of what America has to offer. You're trying to make sure that the policies that we're espousing get through and that they're enacted and that we protect the national interests. And then there's a conversation that you have off the record where they get to know you as an individual. And those relationships carry over. Um, you're a junior officer one day, the next, like, next time you're a mid-level officer, and that same person you talked to and had a relationship with is now the foreign minister or the deputy foreign minister. And then 10 years later, they may be the president of the country. And I think it's about empathy. I think one of the things that uh, women and people of color have when they're in the foreign service is an automatic door opening. I mean, I can't tell you, in Jordan, every country I've been to, I've always had the best relationships and the best contact outside the embassy. I'm not bragging. You go back and check my record. 
And that's not because I was the smartest guy, but people were always drawn to an African-American about where they've been and how they got there. And they're always interested, how did you get there and you're not in the military? And then that began a conversation about who you are and how you got there. And then you're gonna disagree. There's always gonna be a point where you, you're gonna to agree to disagree, but they understand they have their interests and you have yours. And if you're able to manage those two relationships in that way, they will go a long way. I just wanna add something real quick. Uh, the, the question started with tripping up. Do not be afraid of that. Do not let that be a deterrent to finding your way to action, to educating yourself, to engaging in relationship building, to engaging in conversations. It's inevitable. This is all an uncomfortable space, an uncomfortable dialogue. It's new to you. And as you learn, you are going to make mistakes, but dust yourself off, learn from what happened in that engagement and keep trying it. To Bonnie's point about action, like an ally is rooted in action. Do not let fear of making a mistake, which is inevitable, um, keep you from that action. Thanks for that comment. Now, Alonzo, I can relate with you because as a woman who served as a junior officer working in the Ministry of Defense in Kuwait, Many of them said to me, how did you get here? <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. you know, working on the gender and the, you know, being an African-American and the slaves, how did you get here? And it was an amazing experience in there. Coming up the ranks in the Ministry of Defense now. <laughs> now uh, we will move on to the next question. Um, we had a, a commenter note that the United States has been take, uh, taken seriously as a moral force throughout our history, despite our racist uh, uh, failings. Can you make an argument to convince the skeptics that progress on racial justice at home really is essential to our diplomacy? This is a question to Michelle and Alonso. Uh, no, I, 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 you know, I, I think that we have been able to exert leadership and have periods in our diplomacy, in our history, where I would argue that we were a force for good despite the fact that we had this horrible legacy of systemic racism and inequality. So it's, it's it, but I think um, now that there's, this is, it, it, we're in a different age where it, you know, in, in the global media age, in the, the, this period of, you know, total communication and transparency, um, you know, and in and a, and a period of such pain, and it's it's just so, you can't ignore it, and the world sees it. And so I think we're in a different moment now that if we go forward and just try to push it back under the rug or pretend that it has nothing to do with how we're seen in the world, it's not gonna work. Uh, I think the fact is, this moment is a challenge and the world is gonna watch us rise to that challenge and deal with it seriously. And, and we will get huge, you know, sort of credit and appreciation for that, or we will not. Um, and, and, and I think that will hurt us. So I think it's a different moment for a lot of reasons. Um, and that how we do on these questions will actually affect our capacity to lead, our ability to lead in the future, at least the ability of uh, the, the willingness of others to follow and to, to join forces. Yeah, I just add quickly, the conflict for us has always been obvious. Um, and the countries that we've been sent out to to implement policies that were similarly, similarly being inflicted against us in our own country. Um, but we've always been able to find a way to rise above it. And I think what we have to continue to do is raise our voices, the conversations we're having now to change things, uh, and then come about and, and find a way to identify a real way forward. And I think by putting the kind of metrics in place that we're talking about moving forward, that's gonna give us an opportunity to really bring about real change uh, and measure that change. And I think raising our voices is one thing once again, but what are the metrics we're putting in place that allow for us to be accountable going forth. And that's why I think the young people, and I talked about you guys earlier, that your advocacy and your media savviness and your unre and, and being restless is gonna help drive this process and force us to be better. Uh, because with that kind of interdiction, 
Uh, it forces decision makers who don't like seeing their name in the press, the 24 hour press, it forces them to be much more conscious about the things that they're advocating. And I think it's also gonna make us better as a nation in regards to advocating and developing future policy. Thank you. Next question, um, <laughs> an interesting one. Uh, what happens if Trump wins again? What does this mean for people of color in foreign policy and national security, whether in government or outside of government? And where do we go from here if we can't meet the moment? This is anonymous, but um, I will go with Bonnie, then Camille. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <Marshall. laughs> um, awesome. Yes, well, if, if, if we have another uh, Trump administration, um, well, first of all, um, it'll be either the status quo or depending on your viewpoint, it could be worse. Um, as people of color, we have to continue to um, not be discouraged. We have to recognize that we must continue to do what we have been doing. Um, and we have, to, we have to recognize and, um, you know, the country is very divided. And a lot of times, um, those who are not of, uh, you know, of the Trump party are often made to feel that they don't matter that what they think and feel as Americans are not important. Um, and very often, um, it, it, I mean, I think I can say that without being political, um, there's been, you know, you have negative things said about women and people of color that are not things that would be particularly, would make you feel very included. And, and so it's a feeling that many Americans have of not being a part of America, not being included in America, not being considered as valued. And I think, you know, if we have another administration, we have to fight against that. We have to fight against the feeling that, you know, if you're not part of the, you know, of the, of the ruling party, that you're not important. Um, and I think we have to keep, keep ourselves empowered. We have to have, we have to remain, um, vigilant and recognize that this is our America too. And we have paid a large price to be a part of this country, um, to help build this country, carried a lot of it on the backs of many people, uh, vulnerable communities, black, indigenous, you know, Hispanics, Asians, you know, Muslim, all of us have been, have had to deal with a lot of things and, and women as well. So we have to recognize that we're a part of America and that we should not feel like we're not. And we have to be vigilant and we have to be strong and we have to keep up the fight. I agree with that. I, I think that um, undeniably it will be tough for people of color and disenfranchised groups in this country. But I also think to build off Bonnie's point, there will be shifts in governance structures, right? The private, we've already seen the private sector respond by creating new norms and filling gaps and demanding justice in their spheres of influence and civil society is doing the same. And I think we'll see um, a much larger shift in how America governs itself because these institutions, civil society, industry, et cetera, will continue to make demands in their sphere of influence that will change those dynamics. And I hope we rise to meet that moment in addition to what Bonnie is saying about us not letting ourselves feel um, disconnected and disengaged from our democratic process and making our voices heard within this nation. But that will be undeniably hard because we will be reinforcing a perception um, both at the individual level and at a global level that what's happening right now is okay and it is not. And I don't think that that is the sentiment of the, the broadest swath of the American people. But um, if Trump is reelected, that is what we will be saying to ourselves and to the world. Thank you for a good point. And you know, most likely political instability may persist 
but we cannot allow that to continue to divide us, but bring us together to continue to mobilize, advocate, uh, our, continue our advocacy. Okay, our next question. How do we make progress when so much of our field relies on networks, which are saturated with unconscious bias? This is for Michelle. It's a great question. And I think um, the first thing is, um, you know, you, we have to ask and expect of our leaders that they recognize this. Um, and I, I actually think it's very important to start to have leaders sort of really reflect on their own experiences and their own biases, um, but also to do have a clear-eyed assessment of the organization that they're inheriting and, and to have a factual basis of how bad is it? You know, how far from the, the goal are we really here? Um, and then I think you, you have to take a very proactive approach um, that says this is, a, you know, if, if you're a leader in an organization, this is an, a responsibility that you have. And you can't just, well, say, oh, I'm open to, you know, people of color coming to ask me to be a mentor. You got to go out and proactively find people that you want to mentor or sponsor. Um, you can't just sit back and admire, you know, say, well, if the incentive, you know, it's all about incentives, and if the incentives that di were different, maybe the promotion boards would behave differently. You got to get in there and look at, well, what is the incentive structure, and how does it need to be changed or realigned towards a set of goals? So, and you, you have to hold yourself accountable, and you also have to be willing to hold others in the system accountable. And in my experience when when that happens it's amazing how behavior changes you know people are very smart somebody talked about the gatekeepers the gatekeepers are smart <laughs> if they realize there's a new sheriff in town now this really matters and oh someone's watching and i'm going to be held accountable and how i behave will actually affect my own career prospects it's amazing how behavior changes so i think i think um, that's something that we need to, I think, unpack in a much more systematic way to say, how do we align all those incentive structures um, across the board? And then how do we hold ourselves and, the, and others in the system accountable? Asha, if I can just add there, I think also it, it's important to recognize we all have unconscious bias, right? We all do. And so New America, when I, when I got there in 2013, was uh, minority women. We're now 70% women, 75%. And one of the things I recognize is, you know, we, we hire people who look like us, who have the same experience we do because we feel comfortable with them. And Camille said something very important. You know, we've got to be able to be uncomfortable. We're never going to have the conversations we need to have unless we can be uncomfortable. And that goes also for recognizing, yeah, my instinct says this person's terrific. Well, this person's terrific because he looks so, she looks like me. You know, that's this person's more likely to think like me. And I need people who are diverse. But I think it's important to 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 recognize that this isn't always, it's, you're not necessarily racist. You're not necessarily sexist. You are human and human beings like the people who are like them. And we have to make a real effort, all of us, uh, to, to get out of that, the, that, those, those biases and constraints. I, I call it, Anne-Marie, the mini-me approach to mentorship and sponsorship. <laughs> oh, they remind me of myself 20 years ago, right? Exactly right. That's a really good point because I think that's a problem with all of us, um, you know, and it's something a work in progress, you know, it started with us from little to where we ingrained some sort of these unconscious bias when we were in school and then lived with us beyond that. and that's something that we definitely have to work on moving forward. Um, next question, um, Kai Dinan uh, asks a specific question about how a propo uh, proposed congressional commission on counterterrorism policy can be constructed to include the voices of people affected by U.S. counterterrorism policy. More broadly, how can the way we make U.S. policy evolve to include affected communities? 
Was that directed to anybody? Yes, sorry. Uh, well, I'll let Alonzo to answer as well as Michelle. Ladies first again, go ahead, Michelle. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually think that um, there is, this is a moment in time when, you know, a lot has happened um, since 9-11 and the original authorization for the use of military force, the original way that we thought about the focus on Al Qaeda and its direct affiliates. Now we have ISIS, we have so many other groups that have evolved and changed and morphed. Um, and, um, and, the, and the strategy and approach has broadened to include a lot of activities that were not necessarily there at the beginning. So I do think this is, you know, 20 years in, uh, or, um, you know, uh, it's, it's worth actually taking a pretty hard look at the counterterrorism approach, which writ large, not just the military dimension, but all of the dimensions. Um, and I think in doing that, it would be very interesting to talk to people who've been directly affected, um, uh, including so much of our counterterrorism approach has been focused on building partner capacity. You know, the idea that if we build local indigenous forces, then that lessens the burden on us. It increases their capacity to provide for their own security. Well, how has that actually worked? You know, where has it worked? Why has it worked when, it's, when, it, when it hasn't worked so well? Why hasn't it worked? What do we learn from that? How do we, you know, what, how do we take those things into account? So I think it's a really interesting idea. I have to give some more thought to how yeah. you'd actually implement it. But um, that's where, you know, Alonzo has had, you know, 30 more seconds to think about this and I have, he's going to jump in with some great ideas. <laughs> no, I, and Michelle, I, this is a, a, a complex issue. And as you said, the laws and regulations that have been put, out, put in place for, in, the, in the name of national security over the last 10 years or 12 years have become overlapping. And I think that they're gonna, we're going to have to go back and take a look at how we're implementing some of these policies, but also going back to the people who are being affected by it. And we always talk about the browning of America. Um, we are a country that is diversely different than we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we continue to be that. And I think if we don't go and interview and talk to people and find out what's working not, and, not, and it's not working, then I think we have a 10 ear and we're gonna create even more angst within our own country. That's gonna create a national security problem for us. So I'm hoping that there'll be a lot of policy reviews. And look, we're not trying to turn the system on its head, but we gotta make it better. And if we're not evaluating and looking at information and interviewing people and addressing those issues, then we're not doing our jobs. Uh, and that's a problem. And can I jump in here, Asha, just very briefly. Um, when you talk about commissions, I mean, I was on the 9-11 commission. And one of the things that I thought that kept that so um, real is that we were, we were, our real, our real, um, the ones we were really answering to, even though it was a congressional commission, mandated commission, and many of you may remember, it was really, uh, it was really done because the families really pushed it, but there was a resistance by Congress to have it. Um, one of the things that kept it real was that we felt like we were answering to the families. Mm -hmm. It was the families who were, who we were connecting to on a regular basis when we were on the Hill, um, presenting parts of the report during the process, the families were there, they were interviewed after each one of these, uh, each one of these discussions. And so, um, you know, having those who are impacted or have been impacted is fundamental to being true and being real about anything you're, any kind of whatever you're doing with the commission. Um, and so if you're, if you're gonna have any kind of commission, you have to have the people that you're answering to, not just people who set you up, but the people who are gonna be affected, not only for the reason why you have it, but will be affected by whatever comes out of that study or commission. I just want to add something. We've seen this model in the private sector as product inclusion becomes a bigger apparatus in organizations. It is scalable to find ways to have um, either DEI experts, people affected by um, a policy or a tool become spun up and address or reflect on review 
a given policy, system, institution, et cetera, as a response to it being developed or about to launch. And so we should be creative about how we engage the communities that will be affected by the policies we're building. Thank you, Camille. I just want to also add to it in terms of counterterrorism, we want to may look into the non-military tools that they may use against us. Where, we, where they would uh, gain that influence from great power competition. Like if you read the Gray Zone report uh, done by Dr. Hicks over at um, CSIS, they talk a lot about the use of non-military tools. So uh, that's very important, you know, to keep track of. But only way to understand is you understand the culture of, of, of those non-state actors, and that's really important. Um, okay, good. So we'll move on now to the next question. Do you think the principles of development economics could be applied in a way that promotes convergence for America's poorest co communities? This is for uh, Bonnie and Anne-Marie. <laughs> I'll let you go first, Anne-Marie, because uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> oh, well, so I, uh, I'll, uh, I'm happy to, to uh, answer. I, I, if, if, if the question is, should we be thinking about development at home as much as abroad, the answer is unequivocally yes. I grew up in the world like other places need to be developed. I am sitting here in Princeton, New Jersey. Look at Camden, New Jersey. Look at Newark, New Jersey. Look at plenty of towns and cities in the United States. And then look at plenty of towns and cities around the world. Obviously, the problems differ because of the cu big cultural differences, but poverty, illiteracy, lack of opportunity, lack of good nutrition, you know, lack of access to energy. We've got folks in the, across the United States that don't have broadband and can't get to school. We can learn a lot from other countries. So if the question is, should we stop thinking of development as something that happens out there and poverty is something that happens here and have a much more integrated approach where we recognize that we can learn, we can learn from India's frugal innovation. We can learn from the way Kenya uses digital money. We can use, learn from the way uh, folks in Brazil use conditional cash transfers, absolutely. And I think development economics, again, this whole foreign policy development versus what we do at home, so much of that is based on the very narrative that Camille was talking about, which is a fairly, it's a middle class to, to upper middle class white American narrative. And again, there's a lot in it that is true, but there's a lot in it that is not. And I think of us as a country, again, who we reflect and ideally should connect the world. And that that is what I'm proudest of as an American. That when I go around the world, I say my country reflects the whole world. And when I, I always use the examples of the final five, uh, the gymnast team, you know, that just triumphed, right? And I looked at that and every American's cheering, I hope. And that is a, that was a team that looked much more like America. And so I, I but but the question is a very important one uh, that we have to stop differentiating between development economics as something that's only abroad. Yeah, and I I mean I think that's an excellent answer. And I think the only the only thing I would just add to that is just to emphasize even more the importance of well the importance of not looking at things so domestically and internationally and so domestically and globally because so many of the problems and this is another kind of myth that we have and and um Amory talked a little bit about this this myth we have about over there and over here um but we have so many problems here that we're not really talking about you know Amory mentioned nutrition food security issues a big a big problem here we don't talk about that much you know, only because of COVID-19 are we taking infectious diseases as seriously as we have. We've always seen it as it's going to be over there. You know, um, we'll deal with it. We'll figure it out. Well, we got the capacity. We have the, the, the medical, the global health capacity to deal with it. Look at all the countries that don't. Um, and now it's a reality check. Not only, not only do we not have it, we're not even as good as a lot of other countries in terms of how we're dealing with it. So 
when we look at things like that, we do ourselves a disservice because we, we're, we have this myth that we are much better prepared, that we are much less, we have much fewer problems, and we're not being honest and real about what, what's happening here. And so, when these, and so when the reality hits, it's often too late because then it's too late because we lost a lot of time that we could be better preparing ourselves because we're not looking at ourselves in a better microscope. We're too busy looking in a microscope over, over outside the US. So um, just to add to, just briefly, I think we have to stop having such a domestic international view about things. We have to understand a lot of these problems are global, which means they affect everyone, including the US, which theoretically has such a great global health capacity to deal with all kinds of things that we are not as prepared as we think we are. And that's not a bad thing. As we said before, just knowledge is power. So knowing that we're not, we can better deal with these issues. Uh, last question, I will have only one person answer uh, with the grand time. What positions within national security or government more broadly can significantly influence diverse hiring and DE, DEI initiatives and how? Uh, for Michelle? Well, I think it has to start um, from the top. You know, um, you've had uh, one of the candidates in the presidential uh, contest commit to having half of his cabinet uh, be women, 50-50. Right now, I think uh, President Trump, um, when he appointed his cabinet, uh, 18 of the members of the cabinet were white men, um, and that the every president before that had done better. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the that was worse than every president since Reagan, who had 17, is what I'm trying to say. So we've we it was a bit of backsliding, but I think it starts at the top with a president who has a vision, with a cabinet that is committed to this as uh, um, uh, a priority. Um, and then uh, with a White House personnel office and with chief human capital officers who are really looking uh, to industry, to other governments for best practices, and how do you actually realize uh, greater diversity and inclusion? And how do we create that? And what are, we, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna keep track of? How are we gonna hold people accountable? How are we gonna incentivize people aligning with that agenda? But I, I do think it's a question first and foremost of leadership, but you can't stop there with the vision. You really have to drive it down through the system to realign the incentives, to reward the behavior that you're looking for, to hold people accountable when it's not there. Um, so I would say it starts with the president and his cabinet. Thank you, Michelle underscoring the uh, importance of leadership and a strong vision uh, the top-down approach, absolutely. Great, so thank you so much for participating in our Q&A. This is a lovely panel. And now I would like to uh, pass the baton to uh, Molette. Hi, thank you, Asha. And I just wanted to say a few closing words um, and, a, and a note of thanks to everyone who participated. Thank you for that great discussion. Um, I think when we thought about and envisioned this event, it really was around this idea of how to make this moment different than those um, in the past. And as Laura mentioned, we really had no idea that this conversation would be held on the heels of such uh, another unjust shooting of a black man in this country and sort of a renewed series of protests around some of these issues. And it's really kind of a sobering reminder that the, the progress on these issues um, that are so complex and so embedded really in the fabric of our society and our country, that, that progress can be fragile. And so we're really grateful for New America wanting to co-host this discussion and for the panelists who brought forward so many ideas to think about as we move forward. Um, it's clear that progress really will depend on ensuring that our communities are diverse and you know, reflect all parts of this country. Um, we talked a lot about the issues of workforce and pipeline and really rebuilding institutions to bring the best of what America has to offer. But you know, that's really the first step. It goes beyond that in thinking about issues of climate and, um, and the workforce and um, who are we empowering and how, um, who gets in the room and who is at the table. 
and, and harder, but also important are, you know, what are the policies I would change if we had different people making the decisions? Um, and Alonzo mentioned sort of this need for a coherent policy that brings together national interests into play and uses our assets equally. And it's a really important sort of point in thinking going forward. Um, progress also depends on building these platforms that help to elevate people of color in these spaces. So diversity and national security network and, and WCAPs are two examples um, and how we as a collective community can support these efforts. But really progress depends on holding all people accountable, um, those gatekeepers, those leaders, uh, we talked about the importance of individual leaders and, you know, as Bonnie mentioned, the continuous push that needs to happen at an individual level. But as Alonzo also mentioned that, you know, truly transformative change within organizations requires challenging traditional mindsets um, and the need to go beyond the, the individuals for systemic change. So how do we think about what metrics are in place to hold people accountable? How do we align incentive structures? Uh, and then finally, at the day, really progress, at the end of the day, progress will depend on the actions of the people in this room. As Michelle noted, this is a moment that we can't ignore. Um, how do we deal with the impact um, uh, that all of this has on the future of our country and our ability to lead? And so continuing to ask the hard questions, continuing to be uncomfortable, how do we bridge the divide between who we are and who we say we are? Who are we really? Who do we want to be? Um, are we holding up the mirror to ourselves? And I thought Michelle made an important point, and I'm ad-libbing here so uh, early on, but you know, the power of America is really the power of our example. And uh, we set an example by our actions. So thank you all for taking the time in this afternoon to continue these discussions and um, hope to really move collectively towards this reality that, that maybe George Floyd really did change the world. Um, and really a, a heartfelt thanks to the New America team for pulling this together and hosting all of the panelists, all of these excellent remarks. Um, uh, look forward to the, the next round of these conversations. So thank you all. And does anyone from New America want to say anything to close? I, I will just, again, thank my team. I want to thank Heather Hurlburt and Alex Stark from Political Reform, who have been really uh, sort of a, a catalyst for us in reaching out and embracing uh, both networks, uh, both uh, Diversity and National Security Network and WCAPS, uh, and also our spectacular events team. We just love them, uh, and you can't see them, but they're behind the scenes, and they make things happen seamlessly with lots of different uh, back and forth. So my thanks to them, and my thanks to all of you.